not nude. <laughs> Thanks. Sir. Yeah, right. Yeah, I resemble that remark. Um, let me uh, begin the second session with prayer. The Lord be with you. <clears throat> let us pray. Father, we thank you that you have um, redeemed your church and that you have um, brought her into union with your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for having preserved her over 2,000 years of difficulty, challenges from both without, both without and within. And we pray that as we study her history that you would enlighten our minds and feed our souls, and that all that we think, do, and say would be glorified in your sight. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> My second um, lecture I want to divide up into two parts, a little bit asymmetrical. The first part dealing with the Reformation, the second part dealing more specifically with somewhat more recent events, dealing with the Second Great Awakening and how we got where we're at in the American church that by and large is different on a lot of these things we've talked about. Now you notice that when I have the first part of the second session here, that I'm going to be talking about reformations. And that's deliberate. Often I will actually have typos in my handouts, but this is not one of them. Because we don't, there is no one reformation. Um, the reformation that began under Luther, we could say, of course, started on uh, All Hallows' Eve 1517. You know, but that's only one part of the reformation. There are, depending upon which church historian you ask, there are as many as six different reformations. And one of them actually is the Roman Catholic Counter-Reformation. In response to the Protestant Reformation, the Roman Catholic Church actually cleaned up her act in a lot of ways. So much so that 25 years ago I was visiting a Roman Catholic parish and I was stunned that they were singing a mighty fortress by Luther. <laughs> that, that's, that never would have happened you know, um, until pretty recently. So a couple of different um, reformations. One of them, or something that actually set the stage, it's not a reformation itself, but is humanism. Not the modern form where we might have called it secular humanism. It's a very different form. The humanism of the 16th century and 15th century is um, almost without exception, with a few radicals, is, is a Christian movement. It's Christian humanism. And there is a turn in the Renaissance towards appreciating the value of man the human body and things like that, as opposed to a late medieval um, focus on more kind of spiritual things, maybe less corp corporeal. And this humanism is in one sense a return to Greco-Roman culture and literature uh, under the Renaissance, and there's some negative consequences to that. But in doing that, there is a, an interest in going back to the sources. That is, we want to go back to uh, the ancient literature Greco-Roman, but also that became true for uh, within the church. There was a movement then not only to look at ancient um, Roman and Greek texts, make sure we've got the right texts, but also in terms of the Bible. And this especially became prominent um, after about 1450. There's a particular reason I use that date, because a funny thing happened in Germany in 1450 before Luther. Lu we wouldn't have Luther without this, is the printing press. So at the printing press, what you can do, and there's good and bad sides to this, like just about everything in history, um, if I want to establish what the Bible, the biblical text really says, um, it's a lot easier once the printing press happens because books before the printing press, and even really the first century of printing press, they're exorbitant. They're really expensive. Somebody who has a library of 100 books, that's a big, big library. That's expensive, that's rare. So to have a library like I have, my personal library, you know, just a humble average parochial priest, that, that would be unheard of in, in the ancient and medieval and even the early modern world. But the printing press makes it easier to collect texts. So when you start printing all these classic texts, Greco-Roman and Christian, and um, I can start lining up the text. And so instead of having to travel to the four corners of the world to gather up all the great museums or, or libraries and find out monasteries. Here's a text here, and I've got to take notes on it. And then I've got to travel here to see that one. I can gather together six books with six different variants, line them up side by side, and I can start doing some really good study about what is likely to be the most original text. <clears throat> In the course of doing that, some very interesting discoveries. A guy named Lorenzo Valla, one of my heroes, discovered that the donation of Constantine, on which a lot of the Pope's claims were made for land in Italy, was a forgery. 
as are most things in the medieval Roman church, it, the, just forgery. Uh, there are forged decretals. Almost everything the Pope claims is based on forgeries. You couldn't tell about that until after the printing press. Um, on the positive side, it makes it possible for somebody to take Yank Luther's uh, 95 Thesis off the Wittenberg door, which he never thought was going to be popularized. This is for an in-house debate among university profs, you know, like a bunch of theology nerds, you know, talking shop. You take it to a local printing press and suddenly there's hundreds of these things out there and he's, you know, and the, the Rome doesn't know what to do with it. On the downside, what happens is you have these people coming out of Christian humanism who look at it and they say, oh, wait a second. We've got these six different manuscripts. I'm just making that number up. And when we look at the New Testament, for example, there are all these little minor variations. Nobody before the printing press, nobody before the 16th century ever cared about the differences in manuscripts. All those supposed errors, discrepancies in the Bible that people used to try to uh, subvert the, the word of God, irrelevant. 99.9% uh, .9 all says the same thing. The differences that exist, they're orthographical, a spelling error here and there, a word added here and there, maybe even a few verses at, at, at the worst. It impacts no theology at all, nothing of importance. So they gra they're grasping the straws. So if you want to use twist, turn the tables on and say, you're such a modernist. Only modernists get hung up on that every single word, every single letter has to be the same. Nobody in the ancient world ever thought that, that this was in dispute. Do, you, do people really think that when there were all these different versions of perhaps the Odyssey floating out there, that somehow we didn't have Homer's the Odyssey because it wasn't word for word the same? Nobody ever thought that way. So the printing press gave us that, but it did give us a, a, a fresh look at the scriptures and it gave us better scriptures in a sense because people were saying, well, you know, when we got to look at these documents now, I'm not sure that Jerome had it right in 400 when he, when he translated the Vulgate. There are a lot of errors. So we've, we've got better documents Earlier manuscripts, more of them, we can compare. So we have um, words of God that are closer to the original than they used to be. It doesn't mean, by the way, because God is so gracious, that if you're in the Middle Ages before the Reformation and the printing press, that somehow they never heard the word of God because they had an imperfect translation of the Vulgate. God is so much bigger than that, that that's not true. On the other hand, I'd rather have better translations, which we have in, in abundance. Um, it also created a spirit of criticism in a good sense. That is that things were called into question. There's a very downside to that too, where now within a couple of centuries, it becomes the enlightenment and human reason becomes enthroned as the one way of arbitrating and deciding truth. But in its place, it was very useful to say, hey, wait, that doesn't make sense. And I've got some really good historical linguistic reasons for saying that your, your, your claims, Rome, are not justifiable, because I've got the goods on it. Um, in fact, one of the interesting things about the early Anglican debates with Roman Catholic theologians, especially John Jewell, who wrote an apology for the Church of England, he debates Roman Catholic apologists, and he, um, he claims the high ground of the patristic era, the early church like we're talking about. You would think that would be Rome, the Roman Catholic's home turf, but it turns out he's able to prove we're clinging to what the church fathers said you're the innovators. Rome had to kind of quietly concede the argument. So instead, they've gone to a different tack, which is basically we're the church and we get to say what we want to say. And uh, there's development of doctrine. They can no longer, so they've given up the, 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 the fight in terms of saying, let's just go back to what I told you earlier in the first one, earliest uh, patristic era, all that stuff. That's no longer their argument because it supports something more like Anglicanism in some ways. Most of what they do would be supported, but not the later innovations. So we've got the humanism. Then we've got a variety of reformations that are um, on the continent. because so I'm distinguishing them from the English Reformation, which is like the Continental Reformations, but also different. It's really a tertium quid, a third thing. And they're called the magisterial reformations because they appeal to the magistrates. So Luther, again, would not have been Luther if there had not been the printing press. He would not have been Luther if he didn't have uh, Prince Fred Frederick of Saxony supporting and defending him. Okay, he has a local magistrate, a local prince, who is uh, really protecting his life and allowing him to, to, to uh, write and think what he's writing. Without that, it wouldn't have happened. That happens in Calvin's Geneva. That's more of a city-state than, a, than a, um, a region like Saxony. 
It happens in Zurich with Zwingli and so on. So you've got local magistrates who are supporting these reformations, usually on a pretty small scale. Um, because as we're going to see, there's only one, well, the two cases where entire nations kind of were reformed. Um, you have, and that brings me to the English Reformation. The other example besides the English Reformation is in the Church of Sweden. The entire church gets reformed. Those are the only two where an entire nation is reformed, and that creates some really important differences. So the English Reformation, in terms of its um, basic theology, in many ways is similar to the continent. There are some Lutheran influences, some Calvinistic influences. Those are usually exaggerated. That comes a little bit later. Um, the early English performers are not really reading Calvin. They do read Luther. They're reading um, Martin Bootser and a variety of others. So they're very tied to the Continental Reformation as far as the theology. But because an entire church has come out, um, and you're not starting something from scratch, Luther has to kind of almost start from scratch. Calvin. Uh, Zwingli, they're almost all starting from scratch because there's not, the structures are not in place. They're having to create them, which is why when Calvin and others are given the chance, um, even though Calvin himself um, read the, the fathers, as did Luther, and knew them very well, he re-envisioned a lot of things, especially in terms of church government, that were different from what the early church had said. Um, because he gets to kind of start from scratch. In the English uh, Reformation, the entire church is reformed. Um, when I teach my Anglicanism class at Cranmer House, the seminary, and I ask my students on the first day of class near the beginning, when, did the, when was the Church of England established? If anybody says with Henry VIII, then I automatically threaten to, if not excommunicate them, or at least flunk them, because wrong answer. And in fact, I've written, um, I noticed that you've, there's a book there on the early church in England in Britain, which is a little bit out of date in some ways. Unfortunately, some of it has had to be revised. But I've written a series of tracks. Eventually, I'll be writing a whole book on it, on how the church got to England early on, all the way up to the time of Henry VIII, showing how what Henry VIII, some, did, some of what he did actually made a lot of sense, and there's precedence for it. And I'm just having a great time, because I'm reading all these thick books that nobody reads. And it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating story. Um, so how early did the church get to England? We're not really sure. Um, if we want to be on the safe side, uh, at the latest, 200. I think possibly there's a good chance 100, probably not Justice of Arimathea, but probably early on. And we know that English bishops went to certain regional councils, like the Council of Arles in 314, another one in 359. So they've got, they're big enough and thriving enough to have um, bishops. And when the Pope Gregory the Great sends Augustine of Canterbury to England in 597, um, there's already a church there. There's an indigenous British church, and it's got different customs. They have a different date of Easter. My favorite is they have a different tonsure, which is the monk's haircut. You know, the Roman one, it's kind of like I've got an informal organic one where there's the, you know, but with the, with the Celtic ones, they would shave it in half like this. And there's a few other things too, but they're already there and for 200 years they refuse to capitulate. They're saying, we've always done it this way. Why do we have to do what Rome does? Um, so the, 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 the punchline of my early tracks, because I'm, I'm writing some later ones as well, is that the church was there early in Rome, had nothing to do with Rome, and it survived longer than people think, because people thought the British church had died out. It definitely was diminished with um, the invasion of the Angles and the Saxons, but it didn't, it didn't go away. And uh, there's some just fascinating discoveries, too, about um, uh, some early artifacts, a few existing early churches. So it's fascinating, fast, fascinating material. So there's a church there early. And I kept mentioning in the first lecture about continuity. There is continuity between however the church got there early on and the bishops that are there by 314 and the pre-existing British church. Uh, and that's what we would call it before English. That comes from Anglo-Saxon. That's all there by the time the Roman Catholic Church gets there in 597, but then that gets grafted on, and they come together, and all of that's part of our history uh, as, as Anglicans. It's all there from early on, so there's this great continuity. Well, that pre-existing church that had bishops and the ancient liturgy and understanding of the sacraments, for all the differences between the original founding and the British church, then the Anglo-Roman church, then the medieval period where it's completely under the, the, the sweep of Rome, all the way from that up until the time of Henry VIII and today, 
there's a whole lot of continuity. Um, in fact, what the English Reformation was about especially was um, more, than the more than the continental ones was to reform the Church of England, but without getting rid of the apostolic uh, customs and practices that were there. So for example, um, like the Church of Rome, we retain the threefold office of bishops, priests, and deacons. We don't have a pope, so we get rid of that. Um, we have the ancient liturgy, but it was revised because in some ways the medieval liturgy had been corrupted. So we revived it on the basis of the serum rite, because there were three main rites being used in England, and made a book of common prayer where everybody in the nation is using the same rite. Um, so you can see there's a great deal of continuity because the whole church came out. So out of all the reformations, the Church of England is the most conservative because the entire church comes out and it retains the most of what was there while still getting rid of the errors and abuses. Um, so there's kind of a spectrum. If you want to say which is the most conservative, and conservative meaning that they've conserved most of what came before, the English Reformation is the most conservative, then the Lutheran, and then some of the Calvinistic ones. And then there's this whole group of ones that are called the Radical Reformations. And even that's got to be pluralized because when you get to the Radical Reformers, um, just as with maybe some of the Continental Reformation, they're based on very strong, forceful personalities. For all of his great merits of having composed the Book of Common Prayer and having survived the reign of Henry VIII without losing his head literally, Thomas the Cranmer was not a hothead who's going to start a new religion or a new faction. Um, that was true for almost all the others, right? There, there's a strong, charismatic figure. So we're not Cramerists. We might like Cramer, but we're, we're not, you know, there's Lutherans, there's Calvinists, there's Wingleans. There's no Cramerists out there, right? Because it's not about the personality, it's about the whole church and the whole life within the church that was pre existing, that got reformed. So that, that makes a difference. Um, the radical reformers are all smaller groups, um, again, created by very strong, charismatic individuals who, as we're going to see when we get to the, seven, the 18th and 19th century and 20th century in America, they did what I've been telling you we shouldn't do. They read the Bible apart from the great tradition. They said, I'm going to look at the Bible and I'm going to read it with my own new eyes, not considering that I've been formed by the culture around me, and I'm going to come to it fresh, and I'm going to figure out what the early church was like. But I'm going to ignore everything else that came before because it's all corrupt. So they're often lumped together into Anabaptists, which means um, it's re those who rebaptize. And they rebaptize because they, in contrast to what we've been saying about church history early on and continuing on for centuries, they believe that um, <clears throat> since infants don't know what's going on, they can't really be baptized. So in 1525, Conrad Grable, one of, uh, founder of one of these small um, um, radical reformed sects, is the first to say, that doesn't count, we've got to be rebaptized. And then that tends to be true for most of these other radical reform groups. One of the things they get rid of, among many others, is infant baptism. They also rejected more of the early church than not only the English Reformation, but more than, say, Luther or Calvin. Calvin rejected bishops, but retains a lot. Um, these groups would, um, they rejected liturgy, infant baptism, Ba uh, uh, infant baptism, um, bishops, the church here, the presence of Christ in the sacraments, almost all of those points I touched on earlier that I, I said this is what the early church believed, they threw them all out in an attempt to reform Rome and to come to the Bible with a clean slate. They did what I said you shouldn't. They jumped over 1,500 years of church history and they made over Christianity in their own image. And that's been the basis for a lot of subsequent Christianity that people don't realize because it starts in the 16th century, the 1500s. Um, and they, they start with this idea that I can come to the scriptures myself individually. I don't need the church. It's just me coming to the Bible. And I know better than not only the pope, but any bishop or any church writer that's ever come before. So there's a very egocentric way of looking at the scriptures that, that um, is true for almost all of these. They're charismatic. I don't mean that in terms of the charismatic gifts, but just their personality. They get a cult-like following. Large numbers of them, it's strange. When you get these charismatic figures, many of them discover new revelations. And one of the first revelations they discover is that it's okay to have more than one wife. I don't know why that's always the one they go to, but it's, like, it's just, it's, I mean, it's, seriously, it's like Mormonism. It's, 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 there's a long history of that kind of thinking. I mean, if you're the guy who has the new revelation and gets to call the shots, and that's what's really on my heart, 
then hey, you know, I'm going to re revise the Bible to say what I want. Um, so they don't, and they're, they're, they're anti-Catholic in this sense. I don't just mean anti-Rome. I mean that the church is my little sect. Um, there's not a sense of me being connected to something older and deeper and wider. It's just me and my little group that is the ones that really count. And so there's a very much of a sect-like, or almost even cult-like thing, where the focus is on the very small group. We're right, everybody else is wrong. In many ways, though most people don't recognize it, regardless of, whether, uh, of what our church vision is, the American religious scene is largely governed by an Anabaptist view of things. That the starting point is post-Reformation, me coming to the Bible um, with my own intelligence and deciding what it really means apart from anything that's come before. That's the default mode. There are lots of exceptions, but even in churches that have deep historic roots, whether it's Lutheran or Anglican or Roman Catholic, if you're an American, that sometimes trumps everything else. That it's, it's me and the Bible and that's it. So that's the reformational background. Now when we get to America, it uh, again has a very interesting and it turns out unique religious history. There's a lot of ways in which I really do believe in American except exceptionalism. I do believe that God has really used America in, in many ways, um, but it certainly is um, unique in its um, religious origins and not always in the way that we think. So if we start with the colonies, uh, the colonies, everyone who comes to the colonies, we're talking about, you know, the, uh, at the earliest, the late 16th century, 17th century, they're all Christians, right? So that's not in, in, in question. But what is new is that different colonies get established with different Christian church traditions. Before that, um, there are a few exceptions where you might hold together two different religious traditions uh, after the Thirty Years' War, there's a piece that tries to preserve that, but by and large, if you're in this country or this region of, the, of, of Europe, for example, then everybody in that country is supposed to be a part of this official state church. Now, there would be exceptions, of course, but they would be subject to severe liabilities. So if you're in England, you're an Anglican. There would be exceptions, but not many. If you're in Lutheran territories, you're a Lutheran. If you're in Geneva, whatever, you're a Calvinist, and so on. But in America, not so from the beginning, even before the Constitution. So if you're in Virginia, what are you? You're an Anglican. If you're in New England, say Massachusetts, you're a Congregationalist. Um, you're a Puritan, but an American Puritan, which is slightly different, uh, because the English Puritans still originally were trying to work within the Church of England, meaning you have bishops and liturgy. When you transport it to America, Puritanism loses a lot of that. You have one Roman Catholic colony. You have some Baptists later. Oh, and I forgot to mention that as far as connecting some of these dots, when we um, talked about the um, English Reformation, a lot of the churches that we have in America today proceeded uh, from the English Reformation, or at least subsequent to it. So Baptists originate in England in the 1600s, and it's not so much directly the English Reformation that they, there's only one Church of England that are all Anglicans, but it's especially during the time of the Commonwealth when you've got the Puritans fighting uh, the Cavaliers, that is the uh, Church of England versus the um, forces with Cromwell. Cromwell was the first the general, then the Lord Protectorate. Under the Protectorate, um, there was great religious toleration and diversity. And you have this, this um, amazing explosion of different church groups. You've got Baptists who, interestingly, in, um, if you look back at the original Baptists, they actually have liturgy, because it came out of the Church of England, right? Uh, they're very different from what has become today. But you also get all sorts of strange groups. Um, levelers that want to just get rid of everything. It's like a precursor. The, uh, the English Civil War is a precursor to the French Revolution. It's very radical in many ways. They want to get rid of bishops. They want to get rid of nobles. Let's just blow the whole thing up and start from scratch. You have people called ranters. They basically, like pre-charismatics, just kind of foaming at the mouth, doing all these crazy things. Um, Muggletonians, they go look at us sometimes. There's like this strange, strange smorgasbord of, of groups, uh, including the Quakers. Most of them don't last because they're based on one charismatic personality. The Baptists last, the Quakers last. But the Baptists, of course, then uh, change over the time. Um, and then you get Methodists who come from Charles Wesley, 
Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about them because American Methodism, once again, is not the same as English Methodism. So some of the church groups that here we think of as being very different from Anglican, they proceeded from the Church of England originally, but then history, through history they take on a life of their own. Now, when we look at these church groups that planted um, colonies in America, all American, and if you look at the original charters of some of these colonies, it's fascinating. So for people who say that America was not a Christian nation, I mean, that's kind of a loaded term, but by almost any measure before the Constitution, it was a Christian nation, or at least Christian colonies, let's say. Um, I suggest looking especially at the fundamental orders of Connecticut, who basically say the reason for this, this um, colony is for the spread of the gospel. This, you know, I mean, it's very, uh, it's in your face about being Christian. So anybody who says we don't have a Christian origin, well, they're not really reading history faithfully. Now, it gets complicated, as we're going to see by the, by the um, Constitution, but certainly everybody who came was a Christian. But the very fact that there are different brands of Christianity means there's automatically a diversity and that religious toleration is going to have to take on a different characteristic than it ever did before because now you've got competing groups. And that's very near and dear to us as Americans where we're very, um, there's very much of a kind of free enterprise capitalistic s system. It's true for religion as well. From the beginning, there's been a competition for, for various Christian groups. And now, of course, it's beyond just Christian groups. The Revolutionary War, people don't remember this either in history, that um, it was um, on both sides, uh, it was very much of a religious um, kind of undertaking for many people. And you would find many, many sermons, especially on the Patriot side, uh, being given very, very political sermons uh, in favor of the revolution, more than I actually would be comfortable with. I mean, you, I think you could see history either way about the American Revolution, but to make that the focus of the of the sermon means you're not really doing justice to the text at hand. Not many of them actually were talking about the situation with, with Britain. If anything, they may have told you to obey the governing authorities, right? So it's, it, it's an interesting issue. But the, the, a lot of religion. Um, so our DNA as Americans is highly religious, highly Christianized. Even when we're atheistic, the way we do that is we rebel against Christianity. There's a reason why Christianity in the church is the target. Nobody's uptight about Muslims, even when they're ones doing things you would think, you know, not particularly caring for women and hating wanting to kill homosexuals, you'd think that would be the target. But they're not reacting against them, they're reacting against us. Uh, so, so it makes sense because that's what they know. Um, and in fact, the most rabid atheists, um, I've tried this out a few times, the most rabid atheists are almost always somebody who grew up in a fundamentalist home. They were Christians, and they're reacting against that, against a false view of Christianity. Now, our founding fathers were mostly Christians. Yes, it's true, there were some deists. Some of the most important ones, by the way, were deists. So we don't want to deny that. You know, I, I think history is, is a great um, discipliner that you have, to, you have to be faithful to it, whether it favors your side or not. So mostly Christians, Orthodox Christians, vast majority of Americans would have been, um, more than 95%. A few deists that were very, very prominent. On the other hand, the Christianity that a lot of them held, especially if you read what some of the Founding Fathers say, it starts to not quite sound right. It's not so much them saying anything wrong, but it's the language they use that suggests it's not quite as, as uh, strong as we'd like it to be. Um, a lot of the language they use, instead of being sort of traditional Christian language, it's very moralistic, meaning that Christianity is useful because as a civic religion, um, it makes a good populace. And you see a lot of that in the Founding Fathers, so it's a utilitarian argument for Christianity. Not that this is the truth, and Jesus Christ is the living Son of God who was raised from the dead by the power of, of the Father. You don't hear much of that. You can find it, certainly, but more of what you hear is, is that it's really good for the populace to be Christians for these reasons. Um, and when you look at the argumentation of a lot of the Founding Fathers, they do turn to the Bible, but they turn a lot to Enlightenment thinkers as well. And if we want to be honest, we have both roots. We have them looking to Enlightenment thinkers like Locke and Rousseau, as well as the Bible. So it's not one or the other. It's not all Enlightenment, like secular teachers would say, and it's not all the Bible, like Christians might like to think. So they defi defend Christianity in moralistic, utilitarian terms. And when you look at how they refer to God, you may have read some of the writings of the, I almost said church fathers, but the founding fathers, right? <laughs> um, they don't use a lot of the language of the Bible often. They use things like the creator. That's rather generic. They use providence, 
right? It's an attribute of God, not a name. Heaven, the deity, being, almighty being, nature's God. So that sounds really great for a culture when we're used to people not believing God at all and trashing it, but notice that that is a serious step back. That is a rationalistic view of God. It's God as having these sort of utilitarian functional names, not a living being who is the almighty God. John Adams said this, that being, capital B, who is supreme over all, the patron of order, the fountain of justice, and the protector in all ages of the world of virtuous liberty. I mean, it sounds great, right? But he left some things out, right? Where's the Son of God? Where is the Trinity? Where, I mean, it, it sounds good only by comparison to something that's, that's fo totally false, but it's all rationalistic, and you can see that's just a hop, skip, and jump away from atheism. Deism was um, an unstable isotope. If you know anything about chemistry and how uh, radioactive elements degrade over time, right? Deism was only alive for a very short period of time. It never could really a flourish because you've got a choice to make. Either there's the God of the Bible or the deistic God makes no sense at all. You know, the wine watchmaker who sets things up and just kind of is the being or the providence and then doesn't have much to say, that's going to go away. Deism is, is somebody on his way to being an atheist. It just wasn't safe in the 18th century to be an atheist. So that's the, that's the li most liberal you could be. Um, so when we get to the Constitution, um, okay, so you've got all these different colonies that have a variety of different religious traditions. There's not that many out there, but there's, there's four or five or so. And you want to get them all together. Well, what we were dead set on is we didn't want a state church, and we didn't want to privilege one over another, saying that America's going to be a Roman Catholic nation, or a Congregationalist, or an Anglican, or a Baptist, or a Quaker nation. We're going to be a generically Christian nation, but we're not going to use the word Christian anywhere in the founding document. So there is no establishment of religion, which, by the way, doesn't mean that the government's not going to facilitate religion. Everyone believed that government should facilitate religion, especially the Christian religion in the in this, uh, 18th century. What they meant was the establishment that there's not going to be any one official state religion, like in the Church of England. Uh, excuse me, in England, the Church of England is the established church. It's the church that is sponsored by the state, and it still is, actually. And even people who are atheists in England still want the Church of England to be established, which, which at this point, you know, the Church of England isn't, isn't what it used to be anyway. So um, secondly, so, okay, so there's no one denomination. There's a generic Christianity, which means you're going to tend towards the lowest common denominator because you can't say much about this generic religion that we are sort of agreeing to. Secondly, there's no religious oath test. Up until that point, if you wanted to serve in government in the colonies, you had to be a Trinitarian and take an oath. No religious oath test. So you can be in charge of the American government and um, not, have, not really be a Christian. You're not going to be tested on that. You don't have to be, um, profess any faith at all of any kind. There is religious, uh, or there is the freedom of religion. That, that is that you have the right to practice your uh, religion that was relatively new. We all take that for granted as being self-evident. No, it wasn't self-evident in the 18th century to, to anybody but Americans, really. And it's not as self-evident now to people. We've moved beyond that. Um, things are self-evident to people because we all grow up in a particular cultural context. Sometimes this is called um, uh, the cultural liturgy. There's another name, a couple of social imaginaries, what Charles Taylor calls it. We all grow up inheriting a certain way of looking at the world. And for us, we've all understood, or we've grown up believing in religious freedom. But until that time, people would not have accepted that as being the norm. We do, but now freedom of religion kind of means something different than it used to. So therefore, from the beginning, America has this religious pluralism. You have a choice to make about what kind of Christian to be. So you're not going to just grow up and be, well, I'm an Anglican because I'm in England, or I'm a Lutheran because I'm this, or I'm a Calvinist, or I'm a Roman Catholic. I have a choice to make now. It makes it a little bit uh, of a consumerist kind of model. Um, it also tends towards the idea that the states now, or the state, maybe with a capital S, is the one that is the giver of religious freedoms. Rather than God, it's the state that it has to step in and adjudicate between different religious traditions so we don't have a replication of the Thirty Years' War, which everybody hated, okay? it's, even though a lot of it was not religious at all. Um, it gave religion a bad name, and people were turning to reason in the 17th century, saying, well, reason's a better guide 
for providing uh, or, or establishing a, a good society than religion. Because we see, if you have religious, uh, religion be the center of culture, then you get religious wars. So let's have reason instead, which gives you the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution, <laughs> so, <laughs> and, the, and the English Civil War. Um, so the Constitution, therefore, guarantees religious pluralism. There is no one church group, or even now, um, religion that is the official religion. So if you look at this in America in 1789, and you read that there is no, that there's freedom of religion, no religious self test, no establishment of religion, and everybody's a Christian, it looks one way. If you're in 2021 and you use that same language, and you're gonna be a literalist interpreting the Constitution, then because it nowhere says that you have to be a Christian, then why couldn't you be a Buddhist, or a Muslim, or a Mormon, or an atheist, you could be, right? So the Constitution doesn't guarantee that, you're, that we're gonna be a Christian nation, does it? In fact, it explicitly denies that. The first government in kind of world history that says we're not gonna be established upon a religious foundation because everybody in the world before this thought religion and the civic world order go together like this. So America is really a radical founding. Um, we, we applaud it and there's many great things that have come from that, but we should be aware of what that does to the religious landscape. Um, so moving forward just a little bit to the first great awakening, so we'll get to the second great awakening, but if there's a second great awakening, it presumes it's the first one. They have things in common and things that are different. Um, when we talk about revival and awakening, um, and this is important, what we're really talking about is, um, it is it, I mean, those are good words, revival and awakening, as long as what we understand is not taking place, is we're not talking about conversion um, in the sense that somebody is coming to Christ for the first time. So this language of revival and conversion has gotten very ambiguous since this time and all the way to the current day. So that when people talk about having revivals or this many people were saved or converted, it's not really what's going on. These are people who are Christians who have gone to a, an emotional event and for whatever reason, they've rededicated life to Christ, which I'm highly in favor of, but let's be clear, that's what's taking place. It's not, when we talk about Great Awakenings, this is, these are not non-Christians. These are not Buddhists, Muslims, Jews, atheists, whatever, coming to Christ for the first time. They're people who grew up in Christian homes, in a Christian culture, in Christian churches, that are having their religious fervor be reawakened, which is a good thing, by the way, but we should understand what's taking place and what's not. So the first Great Awakening takes place in the 1730s and 40s, and it's, a, in a sense, a precursor to the American Revolution, where you have itinerant preachers. So this is a preacher who would travel from place to place, sort of like what uh, Wesley advocated. And earlier on, when you get um, the Franciscan monks, they're the first monks to go around and actually are not fixed in a monastic house, but are out there in the world, and they go from place to place, rather than being focused on a particular church. Uh, so you have itinerant preachers, and they reawaken the religious feelings of people who are already claiming to be Christians, but are kind of dead in the faith for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, most notable among these preachers is George Whitfield, who preaches in both England and America. And he's an Anglican, but he is um, an Anglican of a very particular stripe. Um, and he has a lot of interesting connections with Benjamin Franklin. If you read Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, um, he's the one, Franklin is the one who tells us, and I've not learned this trick, but he would preach and he would say the word Mesopotamia and all the women would fall over weeping. So I've not really learned how to do that very well. He also had a loud enough voice and picked, I guess, the right places where he could preach to 20,000 people at a time without, you know, electronic amplification. And there's a famous story where Franklin, who notoriously is stingy, right, this is, you know, uh, poor Richard, who gives all this advice about being frugal and so on. And he goes in and he's determined, because he's heard Whitfield speak and he's heard about all the rumors, and he's determined not to give him any money. So after about 10 minutes of listening, he gives him all the copper coins in his pocket. Another 10 minutes pass, and he gives him all the silver coins, and by the end of it, he's just given him everything he's got, in spite of himself, because he's that persuasive. Well, you know, once again, I'm not sure if, the, if that's the way that people receive my sermons. I'm not sure if I want it that way. But so Whitfield goes around, and um, um, just as famously, perhaps, is Jonathan Edwards in Congregationalist Massachusetts. And he's interesting because he's a brilliant, brilliant man. He is probably still the most important American theologian. So brilliant theologian. Um, 
he was not in favor of the more sensationalistic aspects of the, of the Great Awakening. He saw some of the negative consequences of that. But nevertheless, there is an emphasis being placed even by Edwards on conversion as taking place at a particular point in your life. When before that, conversion would generally be seen as, well, that wasn't a word that was used as much, but basically the idea is you're baptized, which makes you a Christian, and then your obligation, your vow, is to live into that which God has already made you. So the, mom the dramatic moment of conversion for up until this point is your baptism, where God reclaims you from the hells of fire, the, 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 the flames of hell, and brings you into his blessed kingdom. And then the rest of your life is you're living out that which God has given you and that which you've promised him. Um, and then along the way, of course, there may be dramatic points where you kind of um, uh, reawaken those, those religious feelings, of course. But this is the point in time where, where that emotional moment that I had where I made a decision, even if it's just simply a decision to rededicate my life to Christ, that becomes um, the most important thing in my life, not my baptism, not anything else. It's that one moment in time that I can then document. Um, so, and that, of course, then becomes a big part of American religion. Um, and because it was such a heavy emphasis on election, that God has elected you, which of course is a biblical notion, but there's different ways of understanding it, um, it was important to have tangible fruits. But if you're like most of us, sometimes our life in Christ I wouldn't say it's boring or humdrum, but it's relatively routine and normal with a few you know, peaks and valleys. Um, so if you don't have a lot of those really sort of ecstatic moments, then um, you want to find one. So, so that moment when I have this religious awakening becomes the point at which I consider myself to perhaps have been saved, neglecting all the work that God did before that for you. Again, you see how his focus is less on what God does in baptism and has been doing before and after that, and more on me and my emotional response at a particular time. So emotion rather than the whole being, individual rather than corporate, man rather than God, and a moment of time rather than a lifelong commitment to Christ that has ebbs and flows but should generally be trending upward. Um, there was often therefore anxiety about election and an emphasis on more on less the objective state of being in Christ and more on my subjective feelings about how I'm feeling about being in Christ. Um, that's slippery slope, you know, for most of us. So some became more radical, but at least in the first Great Awakening, most of them were still based from churches. Uh, with, um, not Whitfield, but, but Edwards is a parochial minister in a congregationalist church. He's not just doing the itinerant thing and not having a real church. He's got a church that he's tied to, which is really important. And they still value learning. Once again, Edwards was probably the most learned American at the time. Greatest American theologian ever. He's brilliant in, in many, many ways. Um, Whitfield is, in contrast, even though he was an Anglican priest, he was itinerant, not parochial, meaning he's not tied down to a local parish. He's not doing pastoral work, which occupies a lot of time. He's also not under anybody's authority. He has a bishop somewhere, but he's not really keeping in touch with him. He goes where he wants. He preaches to whom he wants, when he wants, for as long as he wants. And when he's done um, rousing up this one congregation, what comes next? goes to the next town. And whatever happens next, dealing with all that emotionalism, well, that's the poor you know, rector's uh, responsibility to have to deal with all these uh, emotional people that have been left behind. The emotion, um, and if you have one shot at somebody, right, because I'm not going to be there week after week uh, giving you a steady diet, uh, a steady nourishing diet to build you up. I've got one shot to, to convert you, and that's what my point is. Then the nature of the sermon is not going to be tied to any particular lesson. In fact, it's likely I've got a couple of sermons that I've memorized and I've just crafted to perfection. Because you're not going to hear the next one next week. I don't have to have a different one. I go to the next town. It's the first time they've heard it. And I have it all carefully scripted and, and, and choreographed. And it's aimed at conversion because I've got one shot to gin up some emotion from you. Um, I'm not going to be there week after week giving you a steady diet and having to do the hard work of giving a new sermon every week. It's stressed, therefore, the instantaneous, the if I've not left uh, some of you, you know, weeping in the aisles or being hysterical, and some stuff, I've not done my job, right? How would I know that it had any effect if you just took it in and maybe were quietly pondering it and it really took root? I want to see those fruits because I, too, as the preacher now, am kind of dependent upon your audience response. And if you're all just sitting there meditating on it quietly, even if it's doing you spiritual good, it's not doing me any good. I want to see. 
I want to see those conversions. Um, so it's a poor model for pastoral ministry because Whitfield doesn't have to actually minister to those souls. Um, again, that emphasis on a particular moment in time that's very emotional is quite different from saying day in, day out, week after week, year after year, I am feeding the sheep and causing them to grow. Very different views of pastoral ministry. So some of the uh, tenets of the First Great Awakening, which then get magnified by the Second Great Awakening, is that the theology of revival and salvation begins to transcend denominational boundaries. So what's more important is that I am preaching for conversion, um, this, this emotional response to Christ, and theology becomes very unimportant because I'm not going to have time to teach you um, week after week. All I have time for is, is a quick emotional response. So theology gets demoted eventually, and the denominational um, um, things that are peculiar to each denomination get kind of dumbed down because um, I want as many people from as many churches coming to hear me. So if I say something that's more along Presbyterian lines or Congregationalist lines or Anglican lines, then that's going to offend some of you. So I have to stick to a really small, narrow spectrum of theological truths um, to, to get to. I'm going to dumb down the theology. Um, and then I also want to uh, emphasize the experiential um, outpourings of the Holy Spirit because, again, I have a need and you have a need of seeing these very uh, tangible uh, fruits, immediate fruits. Um, so this is the Second Great Awakening. So there's about 50 or 60 years in between. The Second Great Awakening is post-Revolutionary War, 1790s to 1840s. And um, you can see how we get from the early church to the Middle Ages to the Reformation, especially the more radical Reformations, to the American scene of religious pluralism, to the First Great Awakening, and now we find ourselves at the Second Great Awakening. And there was a book that I drew from heavily that is in the bibliography. It's The Democratization of American Christianity by Nathan Hatch. He is a first-rate um, church historian uh, of modern, especially American um, Christianity. So I've given you a list of some of the tenets of the Second Great Awakening, and you'll see that a lot of these have become kind of the expectations and the norms for Christianity in America. Notice that it started with Anabaptism, First Great Awakening, and Second Great Awakening. A lot of this will seem very familiar, and it will seem like a great contrast to what we were seeing in the early church. There is a rise of a democratic and leveling spirit. I mentioned this group called the Levelers in the um, um, English Civil Wars and, the, and the, the Commonwealth period in the 1640s and 50s in England, that um, there's a democratization within the church. There's an egalitarianism. So not only getting rid of bishops, but far, more, far worse than that, it's kind of every man does what's right in his own eyes. Now, as Americans, we say, right on, that's great. Every man does what's right in his own eyes. You know, that phrase occurs as a kind of refrain throughout the book of Judges. Is that a good or a bad thing in Judges? That's, when that's used, that means all hell is about to break loose, right? This, this is not a good thing. Everyone does what's right in his own eyes. Um, so some groups deny the clergy-laity distinction. They uh, feel like, well, you know, I'm 14 and I've got the spirit. I'm called to be a preacher. I don't need to go to ordained. I don't need to learn anything. In fact, there becomes a very anti-intellectual tradition, which has been very characteristic of American Christianity. There's a whole book about that as well, but I think it's Mark Noll. Um, they reject intellectual pursuits, because that kind of gets in the way of emotions, right? It kind of makes you calm down and have to think about things, and um, it also creates divisions, because not everybody is as learned. And they denigrate the learned clergy, because you're kind of high and dry. You know, you're not, you don't have the spirit. You may have great learning, but you, know, you don't have that emotional thing that I'm looking for. They reject lower standards, um, I'm sorry, they want lower standards for, for clergy, little or no training. You only, here's this thing, if it's all about how I feel in conversion, then I only have to feel like God has called me. So who are you to tell me, if we're Americans, that God didn't call me to be a preacher? And by the way, he called me to preach at your parish today, you know, just because I've decided that. And woe to the rector or local minister who says, well, I don't think so, and I didn't hear God say that, and so what do you do, right? Um, lay preaching. People are self-anointed. God chose me. So I get to preach wherever I want. Well, you don't want me, then I'm going to go preach in the open air and gather this crowd of, of followers because God told me to. 
There is an appeal to the lowest common denominator because you want popularity. In this, in this mode of, of preaching, you want to be popular. Who wants to go out from place to place and have nobody, you know, one person show up and that person's kind of really apathetic about it. Um, so it um, appeals to popularity over virtue. And um, the, church, the church is affected by this kind of preaching in the Second Great Awakening. They are more influenced more and more by popular culture than elite culture. And we see that today, even in the 21st century in the modern church, that a lot of what happens in churches, including things like church music. Church music used to be coming from the elite culture, so you would have Bach in the churches if you were a Lutheran church, and you have the best music of whatever tradition. And now popular music is the main venue for what people think of in terms of music. We're inundated with it, right? Um, and even classical music is co-opted only as kind of like one more sort of flavor to kind of complement the generic popular music that is, is everywhere. So that's become the norm, the dominant norm of music in churches as well, started in the uh, 19th century. And um, there is really, again, being in the American context, there is this sense of democracy is not only good for politics, even though, of course, we're not a democracy, we're a representative republic, but it's, it's good in the church as well. So there's a level effect. There is an emphasis on enthusiasm and emotion as the essence of spirituality. Not that this is something that's desirable or a good part of our life from time to time. After all, God is the creator of the emotions, but that it is the most important part. And um, if you don't have that, um, and you're just by nature someone who's not that bubbly or enthusiastic, then you probably don't really have the joy of the Lord, right? Because it doesn't manifest in the way I expect it to. Um, furthermore, when I preach, I use the pulpit. I'm not going to preach from the lectionary of the day. I'm going to use a few, a few small texts that lend themselves to conversion. Right? I'm not going to preach on the hard teachings of Jesus. I'm not going to preach on any historical narratives. I'm not going to preach on the Old Testament unless I can read some of the prophets that kind of generate some emotion. I'm going to rely upon storytelling and humor. Um, make strident attacks on the enemies of God, which there's a place for that. Fire and brimstone because that creates emotions, especially if I can make you feel like you're in danger of, of hell, fire. Um, graphic application, intimate personal experience, and testimonies. All these things that produce this kind of emotional connection with the word. And what I'm teaching, or preaching I should say, may have nothing to do with any particular biblical text. I'm not preaching the word of God saying, here's the word of God, and I'm dipping back into it saying, here's what Paul or Jesus or whoever said. I'm using random verses as springboards for what I really want to say. Um, and there's examples of, oh, and so also then um, music began to come in, not as uh, what it's authentically there for, but used to create certain moods. One of the great writers in the 20th century, in late, late, I'm sorry, late 20th century, early 20th century, on um, liturgy and worship is, uh, was a man named Robert Weber. And I was privileged to meet him, uh, I guess a year before he died. It was his last public speaking tour. I was in Hot Springs, and he gave a local lecture to all the people who signed up, all the ministers. Most of them were in non-denominational churches. I was in an Anglican church, and he was explaining about liturgy, and he was explaining some things about music in the service. And he said, you know, in a lot of non-denominational churches, music is, con it is considered to be, to be the worship of the church. Here's the worship section of what we do. And what it is is half an hour of praise courses, whatever, getting people in the mood, and then you've got the 45-minute sermon. He said, that's not the biblical view. The biblical view is that music, hymns, they're a response to the great saving works of God. So you have to have heard something first. You can't just say, I'm going to jump into the service and sing God's praise for half an hour that say something like, you know, praise God, praise God, but they don't tell you why. They don't give you the narrative of God's saving acts. So the liturgy generally is we read something about what God has done from the scriptures, and then you sing in response to what God has done rather than it being sort of just about emotion for emotion's sake. So it's a very different use of music. Started way back in the 18th century. They, like Luther, they made use of print because it was even cheaper in the early 19th century to print really cheap tracks. In fact, some of them were called cheap tracks. Um, and um, they were able to do end runs around the powers that be, not only cultural elites, but also ecclesiastical elites, because print 
has a way, just like the internet today, of being uh, a great leveling influence. Anybody can put up a blog saying anything they want, claiming to be an expert. And I've, I've discovered that anybody can claim to have a doctorate in anything they want, because you can get one pretty easily. I had to do it the hard way, you know, and go to an English university and, you know, be held, have, my, have my feet held to the fire by a really strict supervisor. But anybody can claim to have that, right? And they may not. Um, if you have a religious marketplace and there's competition, and Father Jerry and I are occupying the same space for people, and we, want, and, you know, we both want to gather followers. I'm a little de more devious than he is. What I'm going to do? I'm a little more Machiavellian. I'm going to outdo him, right? I'm going to be a little more sensationalistic. He, he may be just kind of, you know, run of the mill doing usual kind of stuff. I'm going to do something more sensational, and I'm going to try to entice you away. So I'm going to um, use all those methods. Um, one of them is going to be, um, I'm going to be a circuit rider. That is, I'm going to get on horseback, because that's even faster. So I'm going to get to even more places, ride as many miles as I can, preach to as many people, converting as many souls as possible, but doing no pastoral ministry, not doing anything to cause you to go after that. Um, I'm going to have camp meetings where there's a week of um, high emotions, everything's built to a great climax, and then I'll move on and pitch my tent somewhere else. And there is, um, as well, an assault upon me. If you want to be democratic about this, then I want to get rid of anything that's mediating. So Christ is a mediator, right? He stands between God and man. Anything that stands between me and this immediate spiritual experience, I want to get rid of, including pastors, for example. Um, so denominations become less important. Pastors become less important. Learning becomes less important because only some people have learned the languages or how to study or, uh, theology. Um, I want to read the Bible alone. I'd want to be unencumbered by what the church has said, by what scholars have said. I should be able to come to it, um, and I should have an equal right to interpret it, even if I've never really studied it and never had any education, as somebody who has been ordained by God to do it and has studied for many years. Everyone is the same. There is rejection of what we're doing today. There is rejection of the church as an institution. It's really just about me and God. There's a rejection of church history. I don't care about that. All I care about is my individual relationship with Christ now. What do I care about what came before? That's irrelevant to me today. And no interest at all in the church fathers. That's there hundreds of years ago. They're irrelevant, if not just outright wrong. Um, I don't even care about them. I'm not going to mention them. This idea of private judgment, that I and the Bible alone and God alone and nobody can tell me that I'm wrong. Nobody has the right to stand over me and say that's a heretical view or that's wrong. Even if you say it in the most pastoral, loving, kind way, nobody has a right to say it. I have a right to come by myself to the Bible, and no one can trump that. There are no therefore, there's no hierarchy. It's me and God. It's a leveling thing. One of the founders of some of these movements, named Alexander Campbell, said, I have endeavored to read the scriptures as though no one had read them before, before me. So there's no history of interpretation of almost 2,000 years. There's no authoritative teachers. I'm going to read it as if it's just me and the Bible and nothing's come before. And I'm, going to, and I'm very certain that I'm going to get it right. No creed but the Bible, no creed but Christ came in at this time, which I find humorously ironic. No creed but Christ. Has any of you, have any of you heard that before? It used to be common in some circles. There is a fundamental flaw in that statement. Actually, there's two, but no creed but Christ. What's that? It is a creed. First of all, it is a creed to say that. Uh, otherwise, you'd have to say, why not no creed but Muhammad? The minute you say Christ, you're saying not Muhammad, not Buddha. Um, is Jesus Christ Lord? If so, that's, that's the earliest Christian creed. Is he the Son of God? Is he the Savior of the world? Did he die for the, Well, that's all creedal statements. No creed but Christ. Well, which Christ is it? Is it the Christ of the Hindu mystics, where he's the cosmic Christ? So tell me about this Christ. The minute you say one thing about him, you've got a creed. Why not go with the church's creed rather than, than my creed, right? And a lot of churches do that. They'll reinvent the creed, and a lot of it will sound about like the same, but then they'll take out certain parts they don't like, and they'll put in things that the church has never said, this is the most important thing. So we're kind of making up our own creed. Um, there is an independent-minded. We've talked about that a lot. Um, no accountability. 
and I got to make my own decisions. And Alexander Campbell, that same man who referred to his movement as, and this is very American, as a declaration of independence of the kingdom of Jesus. So <laughs> it's, it sounds so American, right? The first part, I mean, how more American than the declaration of independence, right? And there's a change, a profound change from post-millennialism that Christ and his, Christ's on his throne. Okay, this is what's taking place at the ascension in Acts chapter 1. Um, he's not sitting there twiddling his thumbs for 2,000 years waiting for the father to tell him his next move. You know, put me in coach, right? I'm ready to go. And he's just sitting there on the bench. What's he doing in, in heaven? He is what? Reigning. He's reigning. He's interceding as the high priest and he's reigning as king over heaven and earth now. And he's doing it through us. I know it's kind of scary, but and we do it very imperfectly. But that's, that's what the scriptures say. So there's that view. And what do we call amillennialism or postmillennialism? And that was kind of dominant to a premillennialism. Again, this idea of the, um, there's this huge age where Christ is not doing much and it's all loaded towards the front. We can't wait to get out of this world into the world to come, not realizing that what God has promised us is a new heavens and a new earth that is a redemption of the current one, not an escape from it. So that's, that's a reorientation even of eschatology, which has never been at the forefront, but it became at the forefront and very useful at uh, certain things. But when you have that kind of eschatology, then once again, you, um, things become urgent that shouldn't be urgent. I'm not saying, I mean, it's always urgent. The gospel's always urgent, but you have one task then. If, if, um, if the rapture is imminent, and if, um, if God's about to judge the world, then you have only one task, really. And what is it? It's conversion, right, and in the very narrow sense. So all you've got to do is get someone to, to, well, sign on the dotted line, whether it's the sinner's prayer or whatever it might be. So after they've done that, what happens next? Doesn't matter. When, when, when faith grows weak, when I feel like I'm running low on fuel, then I go to the next revival or whatever. But I don't get fed because I've not really read Matthew 28. The Great Commission, by the way, and I like telling people this, it just uses in my sermon last Actually, no, it was Wednesday night. Um, I don't believe in evangelism. Here it is on record. In the New Testament, we're never commanded to evangelize. Evangelion is a noun. It's the gospel. It's the good news. So I'm waiting for that to settle in. So, <laughs> so what do I believe in? I believe in discipleship. What does the Great Commission really say? Go make a quick few converts and go on to the next town, right? <laughs> what? That's that. Okay, some manuscripts have that. If you read the fine, no, no not really. <laughs> it's... What do they really say? Make disciples, and you baptize them, and then you command them everything that I've commanded you. How long does that take? I mean, not just to say it, but to get people to really believe it and live it out. Well, if you've raised kids, you know how long it takes. <laughs> a, a lifetime. <laughs> if you're, so that's a comprehensive task of discipleship. So it's not that conversion, I get your foot in the door, and then I move on. This is why you have to have pastors. The preaching is related to pa pastoring. They're not two separate things. Um, there is an exaltation of youth and free expression and ecstasy, and we're stuck with that today. So even as early as this, exaltation of youth over age, and every culture in the past, you don't have to be a Christian to figure this out, but there's a lot of gray heads here uh, this afternoon, including myself. We're the wise ones. We're supposed to be, and everybody used to know that until the 1950s. If you want wisdom, go to those with gray heads. And our culture says what? Don't. They're out of date. They don't know even how to open a PDF or whatever it is, you know? So, so they, what could they possibly know? Oh, they just know about the important stuff in life, right? Um, so, and I find this is, you know, this is a huge pastoral challenge. Who do our young people go to for advice? Other young people. They go to the internet, they go to, they, 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 they text, they will, they could be seriously depressed and suicidal, and I've known people like this, and they have a hundred friends who are all suicidal and depressed, and they're all supporting each other drowning rather than going to parent, teacher, or pastor. So it starts back here, where there's this exaltation of youth culture, right? Everyone wants to be young. Well, I mean, I would love to have the energy I have, and don't get me wrong, that part is great, but we really want the foolishness of our, our youth. <laughs> Not many of us, right? Um, it fragments the American religious landscape um, because now you've got even further divisions. Not only do you have different denominations which were there from the colonies, but now 
you've got, even within denominations, those who are pro, those who are against the revival because it becomes the meaning of, um, of Christianity for certain people. And there's a new view of religious liberty. In the past, um, religious liberty meant the civil right to affiliate with the church of my choice. So we, we, we generally would still affirm that, that we don't want to be compelled to become this kind of a Christian just because the state says you should. Okay? So that, that part we're generally in favor of. But in 19th century America, it meant that religious liberty is not that I have a choice of which church to attend and then be you know, really involved with, but that the liberty means I have the liberty to determine the meaning of the Bible for myself and not choose any church if I so choose. It's just me. Now, I might go to a church because I like the people and it supports me or whatever, but I might not. So religious liberty then revolves around me, not around my choice of a church that then becomes the real meaning. Um, so this lays the foundation, I think, for what we find today. I'll allude to this later at the end of the lecture for what we would call expressive individualism. That is what we are um, experiencing today on steroids. If you want to know why the world is um, saying these things that are outlandish, especially when it comes to gender. You know, everyone says, oh, I believe in science, right? Well, you know, I, I have a minor in biology. I've taught it for many years. You know, the biology doesn't lie. Um, I'll explain it to you, you know. Um, if you have an XX chromosome, you're a female. If you have an XY, you're a male. You know, I mean, it's, it's not really rocket science, as they say. That's, you know, that, that's science. Okay? I mean, it's not, uh, I'm not making this up, you know. Um, and no matter what you do to your outside, the genes in, your, in all 100 quadrilli quadrillion cells in your body, they all say the same thing. XX or XY, <laughs> there's no way to change that. You can change all sorts of cosmetic things on the outside and fool some of us, but the genes don't lie. Yeah. Um, so, but where that comes from is this idea that um, I have the, um, the reality, there is no um, absolute reality. That um, it does not come prepackaged with an interpretation. Every individual has the right to interpret the world for himself and construct meaning. There's some sense in which that's true. We do construct meaning. We have to make meaning. We're meaning makers. But there is a fixed meaning. And God has laid it out. Um, and it doesn't work out well when man rebels or rejects what God has, has said um, ever since Genesis 3. But um, so this expressive individualism says, if I feel like there's that expressive part that I'm a female, then you, none of you can tell me that I'm not. I feel that way. That's my reality. And yours may be different. Maybe you don't believe it, but I have the right to choose to do that. Now, that's fraught with all sorts of difficulties, not just theological and philosophical, but practical. Because if you really had all the, the, um, the practical implications of that, it wouldn't work, right? Because I can claim to be, um, you know, if you want to come after me for taxes, I can claim to be really poor. I don't care what my bank book says. I'm, I feel poor, though. You know, I'm sorry. And I feel like I'm 70, so I really want to start getting Social Security now. I know I've got 10 years more that I'm trying to hold on for, but I probably should get that now. And, you know, what, and I, I really am, you know, seven feet tall. I know I don't feel like it, but don't look like it. I mean, but I do feel like it. So, but that's, that's what this comes from this idea that I get to choose reality. One of our members says I identify as a toaster. Yes, right. <laughs> well, I'll figure out who that is. <laughs> Why not, right? Why not? Um, and uh, along with that, there's loose membership, right? If I'm in charge, then it's really about me being in charge of my spiritual life. I'm not connected to anybody else except for when I choose to be. So I might be actually deeply involved in a church, but only because I've said that I should be. And if I, the minute I choose not to because Father Jerry confronts me with some sin in my life, I'm out of here because I'm really in charge. And I was explaining to Father Jerry a little while ago that we have a sign um, at our, you know, our copy machine at our um, parochial school that says, he who makes himself his own spiritual director has apprenticed himself to a fool. So we basically say, we're in charge of my spiritual life. I don't want anybody helping me or telling me what to do. So here's the issue. So I'm the one with the sin problem and the disordered life. And I've got to be wise enough and strong enough to discern what the problem is and diagnose what the problem is and heal myself. Well, we're not made for that. We're made for a body. We're made for life together. So that's, that's what has become of this, is this, this loose membership. No creeds, 
No confession of faith either. I don't want to be encumbered by creeds or doctrine. There is a saying that's been common in certain circles saying that doctrine divides, but experience unites. So if we don't talk about the details of the faith, we can all get along as long as we all have the same ecstatic experience. And that's dead wrong. Doctrine, yes, does divide, but doctrine also unites. The fact that Jesus Christ is Lord, who is the living Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, that unites. It unites the body of Christ, and it divides us from everyone else. That's right. But within the body, it unites. To say anything less than that, that divides, doesn't it? So it's backwards. There is a view of restorationism, and this again gets to this idea of kind of leapfrogging over church history. The idea that the church fell away for a long period of time after Constantine during the whole Middle Ages until at some point, Reformation or maybe even later, that the church kind of, the Holy Spirit sort of resuscitates this, this dead um, church. So it's trying to restore New Testament Christianity, but the people who are doing this, remember, they're the same people who said, I don't need to know church history, I don't need to have studied the Bible, gotten any advanced training, or be ordained. I can just come to the Bible by myself and determine what they meant by the first century. Not even read Ignatius, or the Didache, or Justin Martyr, or Irenaeus, or Tertullian, or Origen, or any, any of that. Um, I can come to it naively, in this democratic spirit, and determine what it means, and tell you what the very ch early church was really like. Um, so they see that as being, um, the church has become, having become corrupt, and they reject, therefore, creeds and councils and anything that happens in those early centuries. Um, Alexander Campbell, again, who, by the way, started the um, church that eventually became the Church of Christ and the Disciples of Christ. And, of course, over time, sometimes denominations become a little different than their founders. But he says, we have no system of our own or of others to substitute in lieu of the reign of systems. We only aim at substituting the New Testament. So we're basically, we're the real New Testament church. We don't want to have anything to do with any other church. We don't want to read anything about what's gone before. We're the New Testament church, because I say we are. Um, so these are the same people who said, I don't need learning, Bible history, or the church fathers. Francis Asbury, who was hugely important in the American Methodism, he's one of the reasons why American Methodism, which in some ways is a lot like Anglicanism, because Wesley was an Anglican until his dying day, so they would have kept the liturgy and a lot of things the same. But when Asbury brings it to America, he dismisses the idea of episcopacy. So he gets rid of that because he wants to. He's very American. And he bases his own authority and episcopacy, because he does make himself a bishop, on, his, on the authority of the apostles. So notice what he's done. He's gone from the first century to the 18th century. He's skipped over to aggrandize himself. So it's rather a neat trick if you can do it, right? Because he said the intervening ages were corrupt. And he even discounted the Reformation. So even the Reformation didn't get it right. But I've got it right. I'm here to say, finally. Uh, and so the Methodist connections that were planted, he says, they are the early church. We, everything in between doesn't count. Uh, we've talked about conversion being everything. I have one, uh, two, two anecdotes here. Um, let's see, before I forget, there's one from my brother. He was talking with his brother-in-law. His brother-in-law was, was in this very dispensationalist camp. And he said, look, there's, the only thing that matters is converting souls to Christ. There's only one thing that matters in this life, and that's evangelism, because it's the only thing we can do in this life that we can't do in the life to come. And my brother is, this is Paul, he's really quick and really bright. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, Jesus said there's not going to be marriage or sex in heaven. So he said, Cindy, we better get busy, you know. <laughs> and the brother-in-law just, end of argument, right? It's like, <laughs> all right, so there's two things we, you know, can't do in the life to come. So it kind of diffused the whole meme there. But, um, and then another England bishop, Bishop Westcott in the 19th century, he was asked by a young evangelical um, man, when were you saved? That's the answer, right? That you, that's the question you give if it's a moment of time. And he said, I was saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. Because in the Bible, salvation is all-encompassing. We've narrowed it down to my individual, interior, spiritual conversion to Christ at a moment of time. So we've whittled it down to this. In the Bible, salvation is the redemption of the whole cosmos. Everything. It's the new heavens and the new earth, and... That salvation, even in terms of individual Christians, it's, um, it's much bigger. It involves good works, for example. There's a beginning, but there's a continuing point, and there's an end point in the life to come. So it's a much more expansive view, the historical view. And then there's also, as we've mentioned, there is revivalism. Um, 
which is a stage after the Two Great Awakenings, but it's the natural stage in the 19th century. So here are some aspects of revivalism, which in some ways is, uh, I find is kind of dying down as far as the number of, of people that are having revival shows is decreasing, but the attitude of revivalism is still often there in the churches. It's been brought into kind of the mainline churches as opposed to simply being these shows that are outside, which is where it started. So once again, it's man and emotion centered, as were the two great awakenings, especially the second. And they're carefully coordinated to bring out these emotions. So it's not saying that here is the, here's the scripture text for the day, here is the liturgy, here is the body and blood of Christ, all these wonderful gifts of God. And I just break down because it's so overwhelming, the grace of God. That's a great religious experience we should be having if God gives it to us. Not that everything was coordinated to produce this based on manipulation. Um, the focus is on the preacher or the music or whatever it is that's going to create that mood. It's less on the word of God or the sacraments or the church as a whole. It's, it's on a different focus. And there is decisionism that I'm, I'm saved at a particular moment in time by this particular means that I can point to. Um, exalts experience and it replaces the altar or the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist with the altar as a place of personal emotional decision. In fact, in certain circles, if you come up to the church and you've heard an emotional sermon and you give your life to Christ, it's called an, what kind of a call? Altar. An altar call. Isn't that odd? Why would it be an altar call? Because it's a replacement for, this, for the sacraments. You're coming to the altar to make that moment of individual reaffirmation. So there's a substitution. Um, salvation then is again is individualistic and it's a moment in time. And, I was in, uh, had an experience in Tyler in 1992 when evangelists came through. And, um, you know, I was still sort of new to Anglicanism. I wasn't, uh, I think I just started to study for, to be a deacon. Um, and I wasn't, you know, expecting anything great, but I thought, hey, if this, if this is a means of getting people to know Christ or to be bringing them into the church, let me see what I can do. So I signed up to be one of the counselors so that when people came forward at the revival, they'd have people to talk to you know, and give them the card, the decision card that you always have. So we had the day of, of, um, uh, of training, and um, in, with this particular evangelist who was a protege of Billy Graham, it was all carefully scripted, so that at the end of the, um, of the speech or sermon, when he took off his glasses, that was the sign that all of the counselors were supposed to come down in mass. So if you aren't on the inside track, and you have 200 of us counselors coming forward at the same time when he asked for a decision. What does it look like? 200 people have given their life to Christ. So by my rough estimate, because I only went one out of the five nights, about 20 other people actually came forward. And I'm, you know, in the middle, I mean, in the, in the spectrum of how quickly people are adopting this, I'm kind of in the middle. I'm not the earliest adopter, I'm not the latest. So I kind of waited and saw, and by the time I got down there, those 20 people each had like five people surrounded them like piranhas, you know, waiting for, them to do something. Now, so 20 people on that night, I think maybe came forward, okay? Um, and they get a card that's got five kind of levels of decision. Now, I didn't get to see that, of course, but out of those, I'm guessing that almost all of them, if not all, if all, not all of them, said, I want to rededicate my life to Christ. Not that this is the first time I've given my life to Christ. Um, so the newspapers say, after the week, 3,000 people give their lives to Christ because I want those numbers, right? I want the notch in my belt and so on. Um, and in fact, this was an odd experience because I was sitting there in the oil palace outside of Tyler, 3,000 people. And in my section of a couple hundred people, at least the ones whose voices I could hear, before he started preaching, they were singing and, and um, they were playing and singing praise choruses. And everybody around me, with one exception, was singing them. What does that tell you? They've been in churches before, and they've been in a particular kind of church. Guess who wasn't singing them? Me. I didn't know them. <laughs> I mean, I'm the ones from the late 70s and early 80s, but I didn't know those ones, so I probably looked like a heathen, right? But it, so these are people who have been in churches before. And, you know, more power to them if through that, that instrumentation that they gave their lives to God and got more concerned about his kingdom. That's wonderful, but notice the way it was presented versus what was really going on. Radically different. So then we have... Um, in the late 19th century, Charles Finney, and then later on Dwight Moody. Now, Finney was self-taught, which is, of course is par for the course. 
he was Presbyterian, which generally had been very much on the side of, of good ministry, forma ministry formation. He chose not to go to any formal training. And in fact, he confessed not even having read the Westminster Confession of Faith, which now Presbyterians don't generally do. I mean, a lot of them don't. But back in the 19th century, that's just, of course, you, you've read it and know it. Um, he said, nothing should intervene between God and his own mind. There's that getting rid of all intermediaries. He wanted to make religious life audience-centered. Um, and instead of working in and through existing parishes to evangelize, he decided to gather large groups of people together outside the church in what he presented as a gospel show. And that's a very telling word, a gospel show. Coupled with a logical, orderly evangelistic sermon designed to elicit a decision to choose Christ as their personal savior. Um, he used something called an anxious seat, which actually was developed first by Wesley. So it's in front of the chancel. So you come before here to kneel, not to, to partake of the communion, but to sweat it out until you've made the decision, that you've gotten anxious enough about the eternal state of your soul that you make that confession of faith. So individuals knelt at the mourner's bench to experience the new birth. So the new birth is not baptism. The new birth is what? My moment of conversion experience that happens. So notice that the sacraments have been subverted. Baptism by the conversion of, of the um, emotional experience um, and the Lord's Supper or the altar as well by the same thing. Um, so it was highly effective because it produced a lot of people um, having conversions or saying conversions. And the, what they're really saying is a reawakening or an emotional response, which again, we don't want to totally discount, but let's not misimagine what's really taking place. So with Finney, the mission of the church was changed from making disciples, like we talked about, to the single primary focus of making decisions for Christ. That's all that's essential. Visible church membership, then, is irrelevant, isn't it? I made my, my, my ticket into heaven is that decision I made. I don't need baptism. I don't need the sacrament. I don't need the church. I don't need you, really. I may want you and like you, but all I needed was that moment of decision, uh, me in my inner chamber with God. And you become a member of the invisible church by making the decision. So the visible church, which the church always has believed in, right? There's sacraments. There's ministers. There's all these visible, tangible things that connect us with Christ who has a body, by the way, that's a very physical thing, a metaphor. Um, now there's this articulation of an invisible church that I've become part of. So whether I'm part of any local church doesn't matter. I'm elect because I'm part of the invisible church. How do I know? I had this experience. So a, a shift takes place as well on the question of the authority in the church. If who can question my authority, right? And how, if, if I have this experience connection with Christ, then I don't really need anybody else to, to govern me. So sometimes he would solicit the involvement of pastors in the church, but he made clear, Fanny, that he was to be in charge of the revival and not the pastors at all, that they must be subject to him. So we see a replacement of local pastors doing the hard parochial work of making disciples with the person in charge of the revival, who's in charge of the whole show, and then moves the tent on to the next town. His uh, model was reinforced by Dwight Moody, who teamed with Iris Sankey, he produced the hymns. Now, they were hymns, not praise choruses, but they were, they were uh, a change from the historic nature of a response to the great saving acts of God towards how I feel about God. Uh, and that's what we see that trend continue in the last century. Um, so, um, and then he, he called it, um, Moody called his show, and I, this is, um, I'm not making this up, he called it the greatest gospel show on earth. Now, what does that sound like? Get rid of the word gospel. This is P.T. Barnum who said there's a sucker born every minute, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it's directly taking the language using circus tents, literally. I mean, so, <laughs> I mean, this is not by chance. Um, you have an experience when you go to one of these revivals with the tent, with the music, with the greatest gospel show. I'm going to give you a good show, right? I'm not going to leave you disappointed if that's what you come for. So where does that leave us today? Well, of course, it's a very complicated church um, situation because you have churches of all sorts in, in America, right? You know, some stronger than others, some more historic than others. But in many ways, in spite of what we might, the, it might look like on the outside, the way we think as Christians is often in this um, radical Reformation revivalist way where it's individual, interior, emotional, rather than something deeper. I do want to conclude with one other thing which is not so much related to the um, Second Great Awakening, but just to fill out where we're at, and that's the idea of secularism. 
Now, it is true, especially in the last decade, that the number of people claiming to be agnostic or atheist has actually been increasing. But when sociologists of religion talk about secularism, um, it's not what people usually think. It doesn't mean that everyone is giving up belief in God, by the way. Um, because what people still generally believe in God, but the God they believe in has changed radically. Um, they've become either pantheistic or really uh, Wiccanism or witchcraft is a good model because Wiccanism is the, is, is the perfect American religion because in Wiccanism there are no rules. I can have as many gods as I want, as many deities that I claim. I make up my own ritual as I go along. It's very American. That's where a lot of us are at, where I, I pick and choose, right? So people are still deeply religious and, um, well, not religious, they're spiritual, right? In fact, there's that meme, I'm, uh, I'm spiritual but not religious. And the word religious comes from the Latin word which means to bind together. And they're exactly right. They don't want to be bound by anybody. They want to feel they're spiritual without having any real spirituality because if spirituality is saying is the spirit of Christ and the body of Christ, you know, communicated um, to the body, then um, they don't want that. They don't want to be part of a larger body. They don't want authority. They don't want learning. They just want to feel religious. So people are still spiritual. They have a religious side, but it's gone other places. What secularism is really about is this, and Christians, we've done this to ourselves. It is about God being kicked out of the public sphere. So in the public schools, God is not allowed to be mentioned. You can pray. Nobody can stop you from praying individually, interiorly. That's fine. No public prayer. No affirmation, no teaching. In fact, it might be hostile to Christianity. In government, um, I pay probably unfortunately more attention to the national level, but the way I've got it figured out is this. Every person who wants to run for president has to do the following two things. On the first hand, they have to claim to be a Christian. Regardless of whatever else, they, if, and you can kind of give the sniff test, a lot of them probably aren't, but they have to claim to be, and the second thing they have to vow to do is to not use that at all in the way they govern. So that tells you something about American religion. I want you to be a Christian, for sure, but I want to have nothing to do with how you are governed. So that regardless of whether you claim to be a Roman Catholic, for example, well, I'm sorry, I've got to go with what the people say rather than what the church says. So, um, so God is um, being kicked out of the public institutions. So universities, unless you go to a private Christian one, public schools, um, politics, um, and then if you want to be online, if you want to be involved in social media, more and more there is censorship. If you want to watch the entertainment, there are some exceptions. You can find them, but you've got to find them. The general, what's out there is that God doesn't matter, or if there is a God, he's not the Christian God. So that's what we mean by secularism, and it's very hard to resist that unless you're dedicated to it. So much of American religion um, is still emotionally based, there is a sense of civic American religion, kind of a generic religion. It's been called by um, a sociologist, Christian Smith, it's been called moralistic therapeutic deism, MTD. Moralistic meaning, and I forget all five tenths, but basically almost everyone, Hitler is of course the one exception, there's a few others, almost everybody gets to go to heaven because we're all good people. It's only the really, really bad people that don't make it. And by the way, we're all good. We're all good enough, smart enough, you know, and so on that God has to accept us. It's therapeutic because religion is there to make me feel good. It's not there to heal the problem with sin, because there is no sin. There are diseases, and there are, in fact, there are not even diseases anymore. There are just, um, there's just things that they need to get fixed, I need to feel better about. So it's therapeutic, and it's deism because God is there, but he's a cosmic Santa Claus who appears only at moments of crisis. So I call upon him like a genie in a bottle when I need to be saved from whatever lunacy I've, I've gotten into. And then once he's saved me, then he safely goes away. That, so people will even, and this is true for a lot of Christians, even people in sitting in pews, they wouldn't claim this, but this is how they operate. The God exists only when I need him at those moments, not all the time, not like he's the actual uh, provider of every good and perfect gift every single day, giving me my daily bread. That's the generic Christianity when it does exist. There are, of course, many Notable exceptions. I mean, it's, it's the circles I run in. There's, you know, hundreds of, of counterexamples, but this is what's dominant, by the way. And that idea of expressive individualism, which I told you about, that it's about individual rights and my right to choose, right? We keep hearing about choice, and nobody can tell me what to do with my body, even if it hurts somebody else. What I feel is true is true. So we've come a long way 
from the early church as you can see. Many of us have grown up in churches, myself included, in churches that have jettisoned a lot of what the early church gave us, and we don't really have much of an idea of how we got there because we just normally assume what our parents have given us. But the hopeful thing is that many Christians are rediscovering the early church because the resources are more available than ever. With the internet, you don't have to buy the 38 volume set, which actually is a pretty good deal. It's not as cheap for 38 volumes as you can get it for like 300 bucks or something, I think, but if you look for it. But, um, you can find this, these materials. You can find people who have condensed and have written about it. Father Jerry has a pamphlet, just I noticed on Ignatius, if you want to read just that part of it. Um, so there are people who are rediscovering that, um, and they're finding churches. And then you've got, yeah, well, this is, right, this is the one, if you want to get into it in greater detail. He's amazing, but it's, so that one um, gets into the nuts and bolts of theology for the first five centuries. But, and so there's a bibliography I gave you for a variety of speeds of how much you might want to in, enter into reading more about the church fathers. But um, I've also put on my um, email address in case anybody has questions later that occur to you later or just want to keep in touch. I'm always eager to correspond with people. So I think we're going to take a break and then later on we'll do the question and answer uh, session. <laughs>